and this is Kelsey Cooper, and I'm the host for Disabled Birth Stories podcast. I hope those in the disabled community can enjoy these stories of bringing beautiful babies into the world and the journey along the way. I hope this podcast helps you feel seen, heard, empowered, and capable, no matter your journey to being a parent. I hope those who are able-bodied would listen to empathize with and support their disabled family member, friend, acquaintance, or random stranger. Thank you for listening, and feel free to email me if you have any questions or would like to be featured on the podcast at disabledbirthstories at gmail.com. Thanks for joining us today. After listening to this episode, please remember to rate and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Please also check the description for our social media links and the link to our merch store. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only and is not intended as medical advice. Please consult your medical providers for all of your healthcare needs. Also, the views and opinions expressed by the guests are not necessarily the views and opinions of the host and vice versa. Hi, I'm your host, Kelsey Cooper, and I'm here with Kathleen, and she's going to tell us her story today. Kathleen, can you start by introducing yourself? Yeah, my name is Kathleen Rofina. I am a mother of a seven-month-old. His name is Daniel. My husband's name is Brandon Rosina. Can you explain the disability you have and how it affects you? Yeah. So I have a disability called TAR syndrome or thrombocytopenia absent radii. A description of that is that it's a genetic disability that affects all of my body. So I have short arms, so I'm missing my ulna and radius bones um, in my arms. And then my humerus is about five or six inches long. Um, it's very short. So it looks like my hands are attached to my shoulders. And then I have a little bit of scoliosis. My hips are actually located in my back and my legs are bowed. And I walk with kind of a sway of a balance between my one leg and my other. I am also 4'3", so not average height at all. The medical part of it is, is that I have low platelet. So when you're born, the platelets are the clotting agent in your um, in your blood. I was born with like 5,000 and you're supposed to have like 400,000 when you're born. So I could have very easily like bled out from like the trauma of birth, but I had like a pretty immediate like platelet transfusions and I had platelet transfusions up until I was at least like three or four where my body started making its own platelets. And then the last platelet transfusion I had to have was after the birth of my son. Finding out you're pregnant and finding a doctor, um, what was that experience like? I already kind of had like an idea of who I was planning on going to. And luckily enough, I live close to a city. Um, so I went to Penn Medicine and I delivered at Pennsylvania Hospital. Um, but they had like offices um, in New Jersey where I was living at the time. I chose Penn Medicine because they are a research hospital. So they have a little bit more knowledge about rare disabilities. Um, and they have a really good maternal fetal medicine doctors that dealt with high risk pregnancies. So I chose them because of their like knowledge and willingness to research uh, like on their own so that my appointments wouldn't be me just telling them about a disability. And did you have to see a uh, paternal fetal medicine? Yes. Did you have to have more scans or like what did they do different from a regular OB? Yeah, so being monitored by maternal fetal medicine just meant that I had access to more scans and later in my pregnancy, they were able just to monitor and make sure he was growing at the right rate and that it wasn't affecting me personally. Um, and so he ended up starting to grow like small and not the rate that he was supposed to at the end of my pregnancy. So they were going to induce me at 38 weeks. And then I ended up having him at 37 weeks because my water broke. As far as the pregnancy went, how did it affect your body or were there any significant medical issues or changes that you experienced? Yeah, I would say it was definitely the main thing I definitely had was fatigue pretty much throughout my into my entire pregnancy. And then towards the end, like I had like normal, just like 
because of the extra weight, extra pain on like my legs or and my hips. Um, but overall, honestly, my pregnancy went way smoother than any of the doctors anticipated. And the pregnancy didn't cause any breathing problems, which they were concerned about because of my short stature. Like my legs hurt a little bit at the end, but almost everyone's does. But in general, my pregnancy went pretty much like really well, I would say. And so starting about that 36, 37 week, how did things start to happen as far as labor and birth? Yeah. So I went to the doctors on Monday, the beginning of my like 37th week. And they're like, okay, we're going to induce you on Friday. Because mind you, my son was born on 12-22. And so with the Christmas holiday and kind of Christmas being on a Sunday and people being in the hospital and not, they're like, okay, we're going to schedule you before Christmas so that everyone that's a, that needs to be there can be there. Because I had to have a central line for IV access because of my hands, they couldn't get any IV access on my hands or my arms. Growing up, they would put IVs in my feet, but in labor, that's not really the best option. And so I had to have a central line put in. And so they're like, okay, we'll have it scheduled. So I was going to go on Friday. And so we were planning on me going in on Friday morning and getting it done and stuff like that. And then on Wednesday night, my husband was cooking dinner and I was on the couch eating cookie butter um because I was really hungry (laughs) and all of a sudden my water broke while I was sitting on the couch (laughs) and so then I quickly like took a shower while my husband packed up the car and then we went to the hospital which was the hospital was like 40 minutes so my labor started on 5 p.m on Wednesday and I didn't have him until 9 9 57 on Thursday did contractions and things start immediately when your water broke? So contractions started in the car. So I'd say probably an hour, within an hour of my water breaking. And so, but by the time I got to the hospital, and like, I was only like one centimeter dilated. So I was like, all right, we're in for the long haul. Like, this is going to be a while. But of course, it was at night. So they had to call in the like on call people to put in my central line and that happened sometime in the middle of the night I don't even know (laughs) um did you do tocin or did they let you labor on your own at that point because of my water breaking they did start me on the tocin when I got up to the labor and delivery floor um after they put the central line in and then I labored for like a long time and then I ended up with a C-section because my lab, like I wasn't progressing. I got stuck at like five centimeters for 12 hours. During that 12 hour span, did you get to move around or any, any kind of assistance as far as ways to get labor going? Um, So I already had an epidural when I was three centimeters dilated. So the only thing I could use was like a peanut ball. Mm-hmm. and Pitocin and so we tried that and we found out afterwards after I had the c-section was that I actually had a bicoordinate uterus mm-hmm. um so that basically means my uterus looked like a heart instead of a triangle and so I basically was never going to progress <laughs> and it was also like my uterus was to the right um so it wasn't like perfectly aligned so my cervix was never going to dilate enough Mm -hmm. unfortunately even though I had an ultrasound like I had lots of them but I had an ultrasound like a couple of years before I got pregnant just to see if I could get pregnant and they didn't pick that up during the ultrasound and so I had no idea that I had like this crazy uterus (laughs) which now like after having Daniel and like learning more about it like the likelihood of me like miscarrying was really high and actually like getting pregnant was actually pretty low like me and my husband really didn't even try that like hard um to get pregnant and so it was kind of like all right this is our miracle baby and um just thankful that we did make it to 37 weeks and yeah it was just kind of a miracle in itself 
So the C-section was because of failure to progress. Was that kind of calm? They were just like, we're going to take you back. How did the C-section go? Yeah, so it was around like the eight hour mark when I was like, wasn't progressing. And so they were like, I, I think you should really consider going, like getting a C-section. Like you've been laboring for a really long time. Um, and so I was like, all right, can we try for just a few more hours just to see if there would be any progress? And so it was like a harder decision because I really wanted to not have to do like major surgery because I was afraid of recovery and like what that would look like. But ultimately, I kind of was like, all right, we're done. <laughs> like we're not progressing anymore. The Pitocin's not really helping anymore. This is becoming like I'm exhausted. I'm done. And at that point, like, I didn't really get any sleep, even with the epidural. Like, you still feel the pressure, um, even if it's not pain, like, you're not sleeping. With the C-section, was it initially, like, just typical run-of-the-mill C-section, as far as you know, until they found the, bicor- how do you say that, bicornate? Yeah, bicornate uterus. Yeah, so as far as I know, um, and even from, like, postpartum visit six weeks after like everything was pretty typical um like they would do for anyone yeah they did like a really good job I guess you would say so I was thankful that I was at like a really good hospital that had like really skilled surgeons and then coming home and recovery or initial recovery even in the hospital how was that from the c-section Um, I think every woman would probably say it was, it's hard, but I would have to say that like the difference between like my recovery and someone else's because of my lack of arms and I use my abdominal muscles to like move and like sit myself up and stuff like that. And so like post-surgery, it was really hard for me to like get out of bed and go to the bathroom, um, and like get out of the bed by myself and so I always had to call the nurse because like my husband and the nurse had to help me get out of bed because I couldn't like hold my own weight but like overall like I didn't really take as many like painkillers and I was able to like walk around like three to four days post-surgery. And how was it coming home and taking care of Daniel? What was that like? (laughs) Yeah so thankfully like my husband was great and then My mom also stayed with us for four days, which was really helpful so that I could sleep and she could help, especially with like overnights, with feeding him or she would basically like change all of his diapers and help me with nursing and bottles and stuff like that. Are there things that you found as far as like adapting as a mom that have helped you take care of Daniel, things you've kind of figured out along the way? Yeah, for sure. Um... I have a bassinet that, like, the side can come down so that I didn't have to worry about, like, the the sides. And so he slept in the bassinet for the first six months, which was really helpful so I could, like, pick him up. And I also just, like, changed his diaper in his bassinet. And we had, like, a diaper caddy that we just, like, stored diapers in and make, like, changing stations around the house. And then his crib also has... We chose a pack and play for his crib instead of a traditional crib. And that has like a drop side so that we wouldn't have to worry about like putting him over, over the side. Yeah. I just learned how to pick him up and figured out how, what muscles to use. And like, I'm not really using, like, there's not as much muscles in my hands. So using like my back and my chest muscles and my shoulders, we have this little like baby lounger that has like handles on the side so like as he's getting bigger I can like put him in there and then carry him with that. So I know most of the people that I interview their partners are able-bodied. Is your partner able-bodied as well? Um, I would say yes. He has some invisible disabilities because he has Crohn's disease but I would say his uh, level of physical ability is much higher. <laughs> Going back to your medical care and the hospital and things, were there things that you wish they could have adapted or things they could have done differently? For example, you know, some people can't get up on the tables because 
you know, physically they're not able to or aren't able to use the scale and things like that. Is there anything that you would have liked to look differently or something they could have done differently? Yeah, I think sometimes like policies and procedures don't always align with what people with disabilities like need. And so like in triage, they were like supposed to get blood work done during triage. And I had to wait for a special team to get my central line. And they're like, but we need blood work done. And I'm like, but you can't get it from me. And so they insisted on putting an IV in my feet. And I was like, that's not going to work. <laughs> like, And so like, it was really hard to fight for my need also while having contractions. <laughs> And so I wish that they would have read my chart because in my chart, they had very specific, like, hey, this is what you need to do. So that was kind of annoying. I like, think when like a resident's like, no, I have this checklist I need to do. But then like there was no one there to be like, OK, we don't have to do this. So that was like from like a medical like in the. I wish they would have like looked at it, but I think like physical accommodation would have been nice is that they have the very like traditional bassinets that are like the plastic basically tubs <laughs> that are on the movable cart, but you can't move those bassinets up or down to like reach your child because of the whole like ABC like alone on their back in their crib, like the nurses would always put them in the bassinet put my baby in the bassinet and so I had to be very explicit with asking like hey could you hand me my son or getting my husband to like hand him to me and there was no way even when I was able to like get up from the bed by myself like I still couldn't reach him because of how tall the bassinet was so I wish that there was like a movable in height bassinet in like the mother baby unit but also like the NICU he was in the NICU for 24 hours and like I couldn't reach him in the NICU either so that was really hard I was always curious how disabled parents disabled moms handled the NICU because there's so much stuff everywhere and something I've thought about a lot is and something I wanted to incorporate into my interviews because I want to educate people on, you can ask for, you know, things that you can ask for. Or I talked to a doula recently who has been helping with disabled um, parents and her client was in a wheelchair, so they couldn't get on the exam table. And so they had to find an office that the exam table lowered because she couldn't get on. And so just things like that, that it's a medical office, like why didn't they, they not cater to disabled people it's crazy to me but and especially yeah. even even like scales like some people can't stand on a scale to get weight so it's I don't know but um so that's something I'm planning on adding to the interviews to get people's perspective and what could be done better you know in the medical field to accommodate disabled people so yeah in the hospital the beds can move but at the office like where I had my like OB visits they couldn't really move they had like a stool that I could step up on which I was able to use most of the time if not I would have to have the nurse like help me like lift me up there so which isn't always the safest right um did you feel like, you know, you were talking about advocating for yourself. Did you feel like you were heard and people, the medical teams paid attention or took you at your word and, and did what you asked? Or do you think you had to fight for what you wanted? Um, I feel like probably about 80% of the medical um, professionals that I dealt with from like pregnancy all the way through birth they understood me and they like helped me and sometimes I had to like continually remind them like because you have to like give a urine sample every time and I needed a like a hat to be able to like put in the toilet 
And I had the same nurse like every time and I always had to remind her. <laughs> but that was like an easy thing that I could ask for. Um, and then like, yeah, the hospital staff, I would say there were only a couple of people that were like not as helpful. Um, and I felt like for some, like some of the experiences, it was more about like liability and like doing their job the correct way, like their checklist, but like sometimes it doesn't always work. <laughs> right. And so now how old is Daniel? Um, he is seven months. And how is life like? parenting and things like that how's that going now that he's older um it's going well i would say he had a tongue and lips tie which we didn't discover until he was a month old that was kind of hard because then he has had some like weight gain issues mm -hmm. because in the beginning we didn't know he wasn't transferring enough matter because of the tie and then after the tie we had to teach him how to like re like relearn how to eat <laughs> yeah and he's in some like feeding and like physical therapy to help him in his development but from like a mothering perspective i think the hardest part is is that like the world already isn't really accessible for people with disabilities but for like moms with disabilities it's even worse or like parents because like the car seat, I can't even like buckle him into the car seat or get him out of the car seat by myself. Or like I can put him in a stroller, but it's hard for me to buckle him into it. And then like changing him is hard in a public restroom because the tables are so high and you usually have to like pull them down, which is annoying. <sighs> I basically like until he can like really walk on his own and like climb into the car I can't really like take him out and to the world by myself and that's really kind of sucks <laughs> um because of those barriers where it's like unsafe for me to take him by myself you've given me some new perspective on a lot of things and um your story is so different from the others I've had so it's it's nice to hear it and I appreciate you coming on to share. You're welcome. Thank you for listening and feel free to email me if you have any questions or would like to be featured on the podcast at disabledbirthstories at gmail.com.